Good morning, everybody. This is Andrea from The Coalition, and we are so pleased that you are able to join us this morning for a dialogue around sexual assault advocacy with incarcerated individuals. Uh, we are presenting this to you via uh, webinar format, so there is a call-in portion as well as a web portion. If you are experiencing any challenges in seeing uh, the web portion or experiencing challenges with your audio, please contact 1-866-740-1260. Uh, that information is up on the screen. Um, as well, please feel free to call into the WICSAP office and we'll do our best to troubleshoot with you. And the WICSAP number is 360-754-7583. This webinar is being recorded and you will be provided a link to it after um, the webinar is completed. So please know that we are recording this. We have a couple features on the webinar to make you uh, aware of. In your left hand side of your web screen, you should see a chat function. We encourage you throughout the portion of today's conversation to please type in any questions that you have in the chat function as they come up for you. We will do our best to field the questions throughout the webinar. However, we will also have a Q&A at the end of the webinar. So if we don't get to your question in the context of our conversation, please know that we will circle back to it at the end of our conversation today. Currently for the call, all the lines are muted. We will unmute the lines when we get to that Q&A. What that means is we won't be able to hear you if you have a question. So again, we encourage you to type those questions into the chat box. But we will unmute the lines where you can ask questions over the telephone later in the presentation and dialogue. We kindly do ask that when you um, have a question that you'll be asking over the phone, that you um, mute your line when you're not speaking. So to mute your line, you hit star six, and to unmute, you hit star seven when you wanna ask a question. This just helps us cut down background noise for the other participants and also um, increases the recording capability for the webinar. So again, that's star six to mute, star seven to unmute. If you have a mute button on your phone, that works as well. We ask kindly also that you do not place us on hold during the webinar if you need to step out at any point in time. Um, we would prefer that you go ahead and hang up and call back in only because when we are placed on hold, uh, many agencies have hold music and then the entire, um, all the participants on the webinar can hear your lovely elevator music. So we ask that you please don't do that today. Again, if you have any logistics questions, feel free to type those into the box or give someone at WICSEP a call here. Let's go ahead and get started. We want to, again, thank you for joining us today. We are very excited um, for the opportunity to connect and continue our conversations about PREA implementation in Washington State. Um, in the room today is myself, um, Andrea Piper Wentland. I'm the executive director here and have been working on the PREA project for about a year and a half now um, with other statewide um, stakeholders. I'm also joined with Kelly, who is our advocacy specialist, and we have other PREA project partners on the line with us. We have OCDA joining us remotely, as well as a representative from DOC here in the room with us today. And I think that really speaks to um, the collaboration that we've been working on um, and are wanting to bring you um, as comprehensive information and all the partners to the table at the same time um, as we share information that we've learned in doing this work together. This webinar today is part of a training series on PREA service provision. This training is open to all community sexual assault programs. Um, the subsequent trainings, however, will be limited to PREA grantees who are selected to work under the PREA grant that will be offered from OCVA. This will allow for concerted support and skill building with those contracted PREA providers for the DOC prison facilities. For those who apply for OCVA PREA grant, the upcoming trainings that are featured on your screen will be made available to them. 
So that will include a forensic exam webinar where we will get down into the details of what providing a forensic exam um, to an individual who is incarcerated, uh, what the added considerations around that are, things that we need to be doing with your hospital, and specialized advocacy skills around pr providing support during the forensic exam. Additionally, we will be hosting a mini track at the WICSAP annual conference where there will be a workshop um, each day at the conference where the PREA designated advocate is um, required to attend those to further bolster their skill set and knowledge base around serving incarcerated survivors. In addition to that, we will have um, an all-day training on June 12th where we will be looking at advanced advocacy training and providing services to incarcerated survivors. So we will at then be um, building upon the foundation that has been grown over these few trainings and really have our advocates ready to begin providing those services to incarcerated survivors come July. It's our hope today um, in, in delivering this training to truly delve deeper into PREA work and begin to explore considerations for advocacy within the prison system and to provide you a baseline of prison operations. In doing so, we'll discuss common language, prison entry, and begin dialogue on the dynamics of sexual violence in prisons. We want to create this opportunity for you also to ask questions that you have around doing this work and also create a space for grappling um, with some of the challenging philosophical questions that we might be having around what does this mean when we begin to provide services to incarcerated survivors and individuals who have um, committed offenses particularly those who may have committed a sex offense. So we want to really create the space for all of us to be able to um, discuss and process those questions that many of us are having around doing this work. I felt it was important to go back and do um, a little update on kind of where we are and where we've been um, for individuals who may be joining the call for the first time. Um, this is important information to have. For those of you who have been on the calls, um, this might be a little repetitive, but I think it's also good just to have um, a renewed sense of where we are with the project. As you're likely aware, um, WICSAP has been working with OCVA and the Department of Corrections to best design an external victim response system in order to meet the needs of sexual assault survivors who are incarcerated. This has been a project that we have been working on for over the last year and a half together um, as a collaboration. It was something where each of the parties came to the table with a very strong commitment towards making sure that individuals who experienced sexual violence in incarcerated settings had access to meaningful quality services and to also promote a culture of non-tolerance of sexual violence. In order to do that, DOC had provided some resources to support the creation of this response system and to provide funds to support a hotline that inmates can access, which is being operated by OCVA, as well as to provide funding through this grant process so that CSAP can provide advocacy services to incarcerated survivors within prison facilities and to support advocate readiness. So these trainings are brought to you in part of that funding that was provided by DOC to support these efforts. As a reminder, a grant solicitation will be going out at by month's end by OCVA to share out the opportunity for individuals with prisons in their area to apply for funding to become a PREA um, designated advocate who would be responsible for providing those services within the prison institution within their community. In terms of thinking about our services here in Washington, a reminder that we are having a, what we call a staged rollout. So this grant, the readiness training and the grant were all part of the staged rollout. First part for our state's implementation was bringing the sexual assault hotline out to incarcerated survivors. That hotline is fully operational at this time and we'll talk about that more in just a moment and then to work with advocates to be prepared to do forensic examinations in the community for incarcerated survivors, and then to move on to looking at in-person advocacy and legal advocacy, working within the facility 
uh, what that might look like community specific. So at this point, we are working on building those, continuing to build those skills with the advocates, but we're also very excited to see the fruition of one of our first stages um, come to reality and that being the hotline being rolled out. So on, um, on the last call, we had discussed that the PREA hotline was going to go live in January, and we are pleased to announce that that line is fully operational. We wanted to share with you all that there was a slight delay in the distribution of hotline materials internally with DOC, so the word hasn't fully rolled out um, throughout DOC facilities that that line is available for incarcerated survivors to access. Um, those materials are now out. Um, I just, just let me read back up a little bit. There was a delay in getting those materials out. They have been disseminated as of last week um, to the facilities, and we have a copy of that brochure that we'll be happy to share um, with you all after the call. And so when the line uh, first was launched, we didn't experience a high volume of calls, and we attributed that to the fact that word just really hadn't gotten out around the availability of the hotline. Now with the information getting disseminated through the DOC facilities and staff persons receiving additional information and training around what that hotline means, we do anticipate um, a significant uh, increase in the utilization of, of the hotline. So I wanted to also focus on a little bit about what the Prison Rape Elimination Act is, why this collaboration has come together, and why it's so important that we work in a concerted effort together to really meet the needs of incarcerated survivors. Um, the Korea Elimination Act was passed in 2003, and this was to address sexual assault and abuse in prison. This was truly a recognition and a calling out of the abuse that was happening behind bars, a validation of survivors' experiences in prison, and an opportunity to bring relevant and meaningful services to incarcerated survivors. It was really a powerful statement um, that no person deserves to be sexually assaulted, and the, fed the federal government put backing behind that in creating this significant piece of legislation and then supporting um, the Department of Correction facilities with some tools around practical implementation and guidelines for what PREA implementation and services should and could look like within their institutions. So guidelines were developed to help Department of Corrections facilities in thinking about what does providing services within the prison look like, not just external victim services, that's just one, one small piece of the many components of PREA, but what policies do DOCs need, DOCs need to put in place to really foster a culture of non-tolerance from the way they screen for housing, from their hiring practice, a whole gamut of uh, policies and procedures that DOC was charged with evaluating what they can do to decrease the risk of sexual violence in their communities and to respond in an efficient way um, to survivors within their institutions. I think with CREA too, one of the very important distinctions was it called upon DOC in, a, in an important way to not only address the needs of sexual assault survivors who had been victimized within the facility, but to really be called upon to have a trauma-informed approach to recognize that individuals who have come into the facility have likely had previous sexual assault experiences, and that that also impacts housing decisions and increases vulnerability of inmates coming into the institution. So it was also kind of an eye-opener in the sense of needing to think about sexual assault more comprehensively than just an incident that may happen within the facility and how do you respond or discipline, but to really look holistically at the needs of incarcerated individuals and particularly those who have a sexual assault history. One of those pieces of PREA compliance, as I mentioned, was that um, external victim services were 
needing to be offered through the Department of Corrections institutions. That can look a variety of ways, and we've seen that play out in the state different ways in terms of some states have just offered a hotline to be able to connect individuals with um, external victim support. But truly the spirit of PREA is to make sure that survivors have access to comprehensive, meaningful, and confidential victim services. And here in Washington, that's something we really all took to heart to say, how can we best craft services to meet the needs of incarcerated survivors given their confinement status and offer them services that are on parallel to those that are offered in the community. And that's exactly what we've strove to do in terms of providing core advocacy services to those incarcerated survivors through a variety of um, avenues. Be it we're starting now with kind of crisis intervention services over the hotline and working with um, the DOC staff to increase knowledge knowledge base around sexual assault just as they are increasing our knowledge level and understanding of the operations of DOC. So collectively as a movement, um, we can be best informed about how we can support survivors who are incarcerated around issues of sexual assault. So is this, you know, when we talk about the scope of the problem, I think it's important to contextualize um, some of the numerical data that we know. Um, nationally, we know that 20% of male inmates are sexually abused during incarceration, and up to 25% of female inmates. Um, this varies facility from facility. Uh, we have some Washington State data presented before you. And I think it's just really important to contextualize that this is what we know. This is the individuals who have come forward, um, filed some level of complaint or concern around a PREA allegation, and we know from the work that we do how many individuals do not um, come forward. We know the varying considerations and as to why someone might not come forward, and those are even more exacerbated when you're in a confined facility, and those are some of the things that we'll be talking about today, just some of those additional um, considerations. I think it's important, you know, that we don't view this work necessarily as new advocacy, but that we build upon what we already know from our advocacy. When we look at these numbers, it really contextualizes that this is a true epidemic problem in um, the prison system. And while there are commonalities to service provisions, you as advocates will be working an entire new system that does have various restrictions and different considerations. You know, it's important for us to remember um, the same dynamics of exploitation, power dominance, um, exploitation of those that might be considered as weak, that there's survival sex happening, and grooming. All those considerations exist within the prison system as they do in the community. Do they have different nuances? Absolutely. So those are some of the areas that we'll unpack and discuss today. Uh, we must notice that our responses and safety planning and prisoner choice are limited by the confined environment. And so that looks very different um, for us as advocates as well. It's going to be important to reconcile that, you know, as providing services to people um, who are incarcerated, we need to have discussions about what that means when your agency or your advocate might be viewing them as dangerous or if there's someone who has committed a sex crime, if that's a difficulty for them to personally move past bias or concern, we need to talk about that because foundationally we're all at the place that no one deserves to be sexually assaulted. So you are tasked um, with evaluating your current service delivery. You are tasked with evaluating um, some of your philosophical positions as an agency when we start thinking about services to incarcerated victims. And you're also going to be tasked to expanding your typical service population and acknowledgement that you may be working with populations that you've had minimal exposure to um, in the past, um, particularly some that we know are uh, most at risk are highlighted up here on the board. But I think it's important to talk about the fact that everyone is potentially at risk um, in an incarcerated setting. But what we know is that there is increased vulnerability of LGBTQ um, inmates with prior sexual assault history, as well as mental illness. 
Um, our research has clearly shown that youth and lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgendered persons ex ex experience um, exceptionally high risk for sexual abuse within incarcerated settings. In fact, they are 10 times more likely to be sexually abused than other inmates who identify as straight or not transgender. I think that's really significant for us to think about um, the reasons why they are targeted and how that is used to further perpetuate ongoing violence within the facility against that individual. This is true also for individuals who have a prior history of mental illness. We know that individuals who um, have severe psychological distress are nine times more likely to be sexually abused than another inmate within the facility. Again, it's an opportunity to expose or prey upon um, someone's vulnerability, a perceived weakness, and also the potential lack of credibility that this individual has to bring forward claims or concerns around sexual violence. So it's also just a handful of considerations that I think are important to think about when we are looking at those statistics, right? We're definitely talking about tip of an iceberg. We are also talking about working with um, a new population for many, as well as some additional vulnerable populations within that population that, as programs, we may have had um, less comprehensive experiences working with, and we know that the volume of working with those clients will exponentially increase in doing this work. So at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Kelly, who's gonna walk you through some of the language that you'll need to know in, about working within the system. Good morning, this is Kelly. Um, I'm happy to be here with you today to talk about some advocacy considerations for working with incarcerated survivors. Um, as you know, and Andrea mentioned, we've been working with DOC for quite a while now. And in our work with DOC, we started with language. What is the language that we use? What is the language that DOC uses? And how do we understand um, where the other is coming from? Uh, in one of our first meetings with DOC, um, we unpacked some of that language and we kept hearing them say, um, STDs this, STDs that, and we were confused. It didn't make sense in context. So we asked, you know, what is, what is this that we're talking about here? And it turned out they were saying, STGs, which is an acronym for security threat groups, groups that are um, a risk to the security of facilities. And, you know, in our brains, we just went immediately to STDs. So that's just a, an example of one of those um, language things that we had right in the beginning. Um, another one that we have talked about extensively with DOC is the term offender. And so um, Andrea mentioned the chat box that's on, available on the webinar to you, and I'd be interested to know when I say the word offender, what does that mean to you? What's the connotation? If you can just type that into your chat box, just what first comes to mind. So people are saying, it means sex offender to them. It means um, someone who did something wrong or a person convicted of a crime. Someone that committed a crime. Okay, so it seems like we have the person who committed the crime. Exactly. So when we were first talking with DOC, we noticed that um, they use the term offender to refer to all people that are incarcerated in a facility, including a survivor, a sexual assault survivor who was sexually assaulted in a facility is still referred to as an offender because that's the term that's used to refer to all people that are incarcerated in a facility. And that was really an eye opener for us to try to figure out getting on the same page um, with our language because it is, uh, right, someone saying that at DOC they are all offenders, exactly. So. Um, so that's why some of the terms that we use are when we're talking about sexual assault in a facility, we're talking about offender on offender or staff on offender. Um, and that term offender is used to refer to someone who is a victim in a facility. So uh, that's kind of a key thing to know as you're starting this work. Um, I'm happy to tell you that um, Megan Basquette, the pre and support specialist at OCBA who answers the hotline over there and previously worked for DOC, has created um, a really comprehensive uh, 
document that we're going to send out to you with the slides, and it is um, Department of Corrections uh, reference and common terms that are used in Washington Department of Corrections, and that's something that will be really useful to you as you're starting this work to kind of have a baseline for understanding some of those terms that Department of Corrections uses. So we do want to talk about some of the different language that's used around PREA violations. So some of the terms that are used to talk about sexual assault in prison are different from terms that you would hear in the community. And key among those is that sexual misconduct is kind of the general term that's used, and that is not something that you're probably used to hearing about the crime of sexual assault in the community. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about some of those different types. So sexual misconduct is the umbrella term, and it includes aggravated sexual assault, which is what is within 120 hours of the incident. Um, and the reason why that's called out is because there's a different protocol for evidence collection on site and transport for the forensic exam, which is something that we're going to unpack a bit in the March webinar, talk more about what that forensic exam protocol looks like. Um, so you'll notice 120 hours, that's the same as it is in the community for evidence collection. So that's something that we worked with the DOC to make sure those two things are comparable to what survivors in the community, um, that time frame, the evidence collection time frame. Some of the terms for staff on offender um, sexual misconduct is staff sexual misconduct and sexual harassment, while offender on offender, as you can see, sexual assault, sexual abuse, sexual harassment. Um, I will be distributing, in addition to the handout that I just mentioned, um, we will email out some definitions from DOC about what each of those means. Um, I do want to clarify, though, that, of course, as in the community, the advocate's role is to support the survivor, not to try to classify the inmate's experience into a particular type of PREA violation. So it's still helpful to know that you're hearing different terms and kind of what those terms mean, but it's not something that you should feel that you need to memorize or try to classify anyone's experience in a particular way. So as Andrea mentioned, we want to talk a little bit about how someone enters a facility and gets placed within that facility. So um, initially, all people that are going to be housed in a DSC facility go to a reception center. And the reception center for male inmates is the Washington Correction Center. And for uh, female inmates, women, it's the Washington Correction Center for Women, which is sometimes also called PERDI. Um, at that reception center, uh, this process called classification takes place. Um, based on an intake assessment of those people when they come into the reception facility, the intake determines um, the custody level, and that's a process called classification. So part of that is um, considering what their risk of being victimized in a facility is and what their risk of being a possible perpetrator in a facility is. And that helps to determine um, what security level they are housed at, um, and who they are housed with. So you'll see on the screen there those different types of custody levels. Um, from the reception facility, they go to a parent, what's called a parent facility, and that's the first facility that someone's assigned to. It's intended to be more permanent, but it doesn't mean that that's the only place they'll be housed during their term. So there are um, specialized programs in facilities, and you may have heard of some of them. They can be education, treatment, or work programs. These are what's called offender programming that they're able to, some offenders, depending on their classification, um, are able to access while they're in, um, in a facility. Uh, one example is the Washington Correction Center for Women. They have a horticulture program, and that teaches offenders about landscaping, plant care, sustainable gardening, there are a lot of different examples within the facilities of this type of programming. So it will be important um, if you end up being uh, a community sexual assault program that is designated to provide PREA services um, with the PREA, PREA grant from OCBA that um, you become familiar with what those options are because those are things that you can talk to someone about um, that may be beneficial as they are healing to know what options those are for programming. There are also specialized units Within facilities, there are mental health units, and one that we want to point out particularly is the intensive management unit. 
That's for inmates who have a high risk of harming themselves, harming others, or are a risk to the security of the facility. That's much closer supervision. So that's something that we want to make sure to point out. All right. Um, Andrea mentioned this briefly, but we do want to unpack kind of what the similarities and differences are of the dynamics of sexual violence in correctional facilities. Um, of course, there are some similarities to uh, sexual violence in the community. Um, perpetrators may target inmates they see as more vulnerable. There are power and control dynamics. There are some that are really unique to the correctional setting. Um, the custodial setting is very structured and it's very hierarchical. So um, that creates a really extreme power dynamic, an extreme power imbalance. Um, inmates have no control over the daily function of their lives. It's very structured, even from um, when they can move from one spot in the facility to the other. It's a period called movement. Um, so that's something to, to know. Correction staff really control all aspects of their daily lives. We want to talk about consent. Um, and this was another language thing that we unpacked with DOC. And it was really interesting for us to learn that Consensual sex is not permitted in facilities. So um, that was not something that we were aware of and it was interesting to know because we um, thought, well, it would be the same as in the community. You know, there would be um, relationships. And if there are, they are not allowed. Um, so the difference here between um, a PREA violation and uh, I'm doing in quotes, consensual sex is that um, if there are indicators of consent, it would be treated as a rule violation, not a PREA violation. So um, just wanted to make sure that you're aware of what the difference there would be. If it's something that inmates are not allowed to do, but it doesn't qualify as a PREA violation. Um, I do want to also mention, though, to be thinking about whether those relationships are really consensual um, and be aware of intimate partner sexual violence issues and dynamics that can be present in the same way as they are in the community. Another thing that I want to mention is um, sexual coercion or what the Just Attention International um, handbook refers to as protective pairing. So an inmate who agrees, in air quotes, um, to have sex with another inmate who has more power in exchange for protection. So be thinking about sexual coercion and power and control dynamics um, that may be present there. And also, um, survival sex within facilities. So reporting and investigations, there are some really unique aspects um, here that are very different from what this looks like in the community. Um, as far as reporting goes, uh, I'm gonna just give you some information about what those statistics look like, and this is from uh, Bureau of Justice Statistics 2013 study. Um, about one-third of inmates who experience sexual assault from another inmate report, whereas under 6% for perpetrators who are staff. So those reporting staff are really low, um, and you know that's, of course, in the community they're low as well, but just want to make you aware of those. Um, so why is that that they're so low? Of course, there, some of those reasons are similar to survivors in the community. There's embarrassment, there's fear of being blamed, fear of not being believed, but there are also some unique reasons to the correctional setting. Um, some of those are fear of being punished, fear of being moved to isolation, um, fear of being transferred to another facility, uh, worry about more invasive searches or increased disciplinary reports. Um, and one main reason that is something you can help with is they may not know how to report. Um, they may not know what will happen when they report. So that's something that, to really familiarize yourself with. So that's something that advocates can help with. So we do want to talk um, about how DOC has specific policies for pre-investigation and evidence collection, specifies the rules, who gets involved, what the timelines are. When an inmate reports that they have experienced a sexual assault, it triggers this investigation protocol. Um, it's often running at that point. There are steps that get followed and boxes that get checked. So this is one reason why it's important to have a confidential advocacy line that's separate from the reporting line. DOC is required to have um, a hotline for offenders to report sexual assault, 
And then they're also required to have a confidential advocacy line. So if an inmate reports to the reporting line, it triggers this investigation protocol where it does not if they call the advocacy hotline and speak to an advocate. So that's why another reason that that confidential line is important. Another thing that triggers the investigation protocol is if staff know that there's a possible PREA violation. If staff have knowledge whether or not an inmate reported it, it also triggers that protocol. And the inmate does not have a choice about whether the investigation goes forward at that point. So this is really different from in the community where adult survivors have a choice about reporting. If the facility has knowledge, that investigation will continue. I was fortunate to be able to go to a PREA investigator training with DOC. And all investigators go through that to ensure consistent response in facilities. And we're hoping to have one of those trainers who trains that come either to the conference or to the June training to provide some more comprehensive information about that. I do want to mention law enforcement involvement because you may be thinking of that. So if it appears that a crime has occurred, the facility will refer to law enforcement. Law enforcement will either say, hold off and we're going to investigate, continue your own investigation, we're not going to get involved, or we're responding to the scene right now as something we need to be there to do our own collection and investigation immediately. So most often they allow DOC to continue with their own investigation and they don't take these cases. And one major reason for that is that there's a different standard of proof for internal DOC investigations than there is for crimes in the community. Crimes in the community, as you probably know, have to be, the crime has to be proved beyond a reasonable doubt, whereas in DOC it's an administrative investigation that has to be proved by a preponderance of the evidence. So I just want to, that's a main reason why law enforcement does not take the cases and then DOC proceeds with their internal administrative investigation. So for this phase, we are kind of unrolling this in a phased approach in this kind of phase one crisis intervention over the hotline and later the forensic exam response. It's important to know some things about this process to help inmates understand. And for later phases where legal advocacy is something that advocates will be doing in facilities, you're going to be providing support throughout that investigative process and so it's something that you'll know more specifically at that point. Okay. So advocacy challenges. There are some. It is different than working with survivors in the community. Confidentiality is something that we spoke about at length with DOC from the beginning. We continue to talk about it. I really want to start by applauding our Washington DOC for understanding and valuing the importance of confidentiality to the advocacy relationship. We have heard from our colleagues in other states that that has not been the case for everyone, so I just want to call that out that that has been pretty exceptional. One example that I want to provide about confidentiality is related to phones and facilities. You'll see I have the language from the external victim services standard up there and it says, you know, in as confidential a manner as possible. And that's just a reality check for us that it does look different in facilities. We are working with DOC and they're on board with making it as confidential as possible, but it's not the same as someone who's just calling from, you know, their phone in their house with nobody else there. So we have worked with DOC to ensure it's as confidential as possible and some of those, some of the result of those conversations is that if an inmate calls the hotline, that call will not be recorded and they're not required to input their specialized PIN, personal identification number, where they are for other calls. Some of the challenges are where phones are. I mean, phones are most often in a bank, in a public area, where other people are milling around. And also access to phones. Inmates don't have access to phones 24 hours a day like most people in the community do. So those are some challenges. Safety planning also. Thinking about how that's different for the correctional setting. Is the perpetrator a staff member on their unit? Is it another inmate on their unit? Is it their cellmate? Different considerations for the safety planning options and why it's important for you to take a tour of the facility that you're going to be working with survivors who are housed there so that you know what that really looks like. So that you're not trying to safety plan and provide options that really aren't available. 
And then some unique corrections issues. Um, Department of Corrections has brought to our attention uh, specifically offender manipulation. So, um, and we've had conversations about how this may be similar to other callers that abuse your hotline or your um, crisis line. That's not something advocates are unfamiliar with in general, but there are specific uh, corrections issues. One would be trying to get the advocate to contact um, the offender's friends or family in the community. Um, of course, that's not something that you're going to do, but DOC you know, brought that to our attention. That's something that happens sometimes. Um, using a PREA report to move housing units or using a PREA report to retaliate against staff. I want to bring that to your attention, but I also want to caution you about being skeptical because, of course, the advocate's first role is to believe the survivor um, and not blame them. So just to have that information about those are some things that have been brought to our attention, but also balance that with your already excellent advocacy knowledge and expertise. All right. When we sent out the registration for the webinar, we also sent a link to um, Just Attention International's Advocate Manual. We've been kind of talking about some things that that manual brought up throughout our conversation here today, um, but I want to highlight that as a really great resource. Um, and it provides some kind of guiding principles for advocacy with incarcerated individuals. Um, one thing it brings up is to be open-minded, of course, consistent with advocacy in the community. Um, start by believing and not judging survivors when um, they reach out for your help. Um, also be patient, consistent, and persistent, um, as it may take longer to build trust with incarcerated survivors. I mean, we know that it takes a while to build trust in general, but this may be um, particularly difficult to build that trust. To trust your expertise. Um, this type of advocacy is something new, but advocacy itself is not new to you. Um, you're an expert in sexual violence dynamics and in survivor response to sexual violence and trauma response. Um, these are things that you can bring um, to that facility, to survivors that you're working with. And I think it's important to make a comparison to other system relationships that you might have. So for instance, um, working with your local law enforcement, you know, those are different cultures, but you have taken the time to learn about each other, to ask questions so that you can work um, with each other. And those kind of um, things that you have learned in your relationships in your community um, are things that you can bring to uh, your exploration of working with this particular population and working with um, the facility in your area. And then uh, the manual mentions deciding in advance how to handle challenging requests. So I'll just refer you back to some of those unique issues that we just talked about, like requests an offender might make on the hotline. You know, decide to staff that with your supervisor ahead of time, decide if it's an agency, if someone um, requests that, like, you know, what is your standard response that you'll give in that situation? Yeah, that's great, Kelly, thank you. And I think it's so important as we um, root ourselves in the philosophies of doing this work to really go to the core of, you know, no one deserves to be sexually assaulted, um, to have the full recognition that sexual assault in prison is truly unacceptable and it should not be part of an offender's punishment. And that by tolerating any sexual assault and abuse in prison, that is harmful to individual inmates and it is detrimental to our movement. That we must maintain a victim-centered approach in doing this work. As Kelly said, yes, we will be faced with realities of offender manipulation, just as we are faced with similar realities in our community. And it's just to be cognizant of those various considerations. We must come from the place that you know, we've all, all survivors deserve help and comprehensive access to quality services. And we have to have a commitment to meeting survivors where they are without judgment. And you know, the advocacy with inmates may look different, but it truly does come from these same core places of philosophy and support to sexual assault survivors. So at this point, um, we wanna go ahead and open up the line to answer questions, to um, hear thoughts that you might be having. The conference has been unmuted. You probably just heard we unmuted the line. So you have the opportunity at this time to ask questions over the phone as well as to type those into the box. Just as a reminder, it's um, star six to mute, star seven to unmute your line. So you are currently unmuted, so you shouldn't have to press anything at the moment unless you mute it. Um, we would really welcome any questions and thoughts that you all have right now. Andrea, this is Lori from Vancouver. Can you hear me? I can. Hi, Lori. Hi there. So um, 
First off, thank you so much for doing this, and also thank you for the link with all the information. That was great stuff to have. Um, one thing as I was reading through it, really thinking about releases of information. So if an inmate survivor writes and wants follow-up, I'm, I'm thinking about the signed release. Like how do we respond? Because simply by writing back, either if it's through an approved legal mail um, box or if it's coming from our agency, that indicates that we're working with them. So how do we... And I don't know that there's necessarily an answer for that now, but that was just something I was really trying to figure out of how do we, with honoring the confidentiality and still responding to them. Hi, Lori. This is Kelly. Um, Thank you. So uh, you're right. That is a complex issue, and it is something that we are continuing conversations about. As of now, we have not had advocate mail designated as legal mail. Um, we're not sure whether that's an option. It's something that we're going to continue to talk about. Um, we're still working on that. Um, so uh, Vicki from DOC is in the room is saying that their DOC is still um, working on that on their end to try to figure out whether that's an option. So you're right, if it um, is not an option, then that communication would not be confidential. It would be clear um, that you're communicating with that inmate. Um, we will continue to work on that and provide updates to the field as we get that figured out. Okay. Great, great question, Lori. We certainly are um, concerned with that same issue and really want to be able to provide resources um, to incarcerated survivors who write us in a way that protects their confidentiality. Um, we also are working with DOC to share resources that they can have available within their facility for survivors to access, such as booklets, guides, and resources that can be available um, in their library and their mental health areas and other designated areas as that prison determines are um, suitable. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. We have a couple of questions about jail in the chat and how this applies to them. Great. So we've got a couple questions. I'm not sure if everyone could hear, but um, there were some questions about local jails. How are they working on the issue? Um, what does that look like as a wide collaboration? Um, this, this call particular is limited to the development of services with the prison system. The funding that is available to support this work is limited to the prison system. Um, at this time, we continue to be in conversations with jails around um, statewide coordinated responses. It is certainly our um, goal to streamline services as much as possible. It is challenging as each jail system is set up very differently county to county. So I think that definitely the core tenets of advocacy are going to ring true. Um, currently, there is just a reminder that there is a restriction on being able to provide services to incarcerated survivors with the funding that you receive. Um, so that is very much still in effect in, for individuals' ability to start working with jails around um, this issue. But that is also something um, that the state um, is in continued conversations around um, how we can navigate around um, that restriction for the upcoming uh, fiscal year with the funding um, to provide those services. And I think at that time, uh, much more comprehensive conversations will be happening around working with Shell. And we can, uh, we can also have OCDA provide an update around that in a moment. Let's get through our next question. Okay. So just reiterating, um, we certainly acknowledge, we've got some folks asking questions about jails. We certainly acknowledge that it's um, challenging uh, for our community programs as jails are reaching out to them um, and that there really isn't kind of a continuity of answer or response to give um, because it does look very specific from community to community. What we are hearing uh, from some of our sexual assault programs is that they are um, uh -huh with their local jails, but they are currently doing that work out of their unrestricted uh, funding right now, and just talking about what those services potentially might look like. Um, Stephanie, are you on the line? Yes, I am, Andrea. Would you be able to address a bit around the funding for us? So, um, yes, as as I think you're, you're all well aware of the um, restriction with, that goes along with federal VOCA funding, which res currently restricts services for incarcerated individuals. And um, VOCA comprises part of 
um, program's current sexual assault services grants. And because VOCA funds and state funds are um, mingled together or grouped together, so to speak, in all of the direct services portions of um, OCVA sexual assault services grants, there is not currently a mechanism in place whereby you can bill for services for incarcerated individuals and we can assure that those um, costs are not reimbursed with VOCA funds. So we are, um, OCVA is looking at um, budget and invoicing mechanisms that um, would enable programs to bill for services for incarcerated survivors and we could assure that those costs um, are reimbursed with funds that allow those services, um, which in our case would mean um, state funding. So um, we are looking into um, a solution to that, um, to that issue that um, we would be putting in place July 1. And programs can anticipate um, hearing from OCV with some additional information about that in the very soon in the next couple of weeks. Stephanie, that, that's great. Can you go ahead and just recap the timeline of those grants for people and when the work will commence? Oh, for the, the DOC grants? Correct. Okay, so um, for the DOC um, funding that uh, that um, Andrea had talked about earlier in, in the um, webinar today, um, we are working on um, a, what we hope will be a streamlined application process for um, CSAPs who are in um, parts of the state, regions, counties where there is um, a DOC Department of Corrections um, facility um, and for CSAPs who are located in the same region or nearby um, a DOC facility. Um, and we are hoping to have that application out by the end of next week, so end of January. And those grants would have an anticipated start date of um, March 1st. Um, and we anticipate that they contingent, of course, on continued funding, that those grants would run through June 30th of 2015. Great. Thank you, Stephanie. I appreciate that. We have um, received some questions around what, what an MOU looks like for doing this work. Um, as you recall, one of the things we had discussed early on in doing this work was it was the goal of the coalition to um, have a streamlined process for the MOUs that it seemed quite cumbersome for not only Department of Corrections but for each community sexual assault program um, to be in engaging into individual MOUs with prisons. Um, so one of the things that we have done is have a working agreement with the Department of Corrections and the Office of Crime Victims Advocacy. So by becoming a grant recipient um, and adhering to the rules of your grant, that is basically um, your MOU in working with the prison system because you are agreeing to um, the contracts and or the terms within your contract. We have another question about which CSAPs are available to apply, asking if Stephanie would re repeat that information. Um, yes, and we'll have more details about this when we release the, the, uh, the application for these funds. Um, but there's obviously a need for the, the CSAP that will be a prison facility, for example, designated kind of CSAP um, responder. There is a need for um, geographic proximity. Um, as well as um, some additional pieces around um, kind of CSAP um, capacity and, and willingness to um, be a part of this first stage of the PREA response. So um, certainly any CSAP that is in a county um, where a DOC facility is located would certainly be encouraged to apply, um, as well as a CSAP that may be in a nearby county um, and as I said, we'll have more detail about that when we release the application. Um, but for a CSAP that may be located in a county where there is no DOC prison facility, there is no DOC prison or work release facility, um, and they're not, you know, in an adjacent county where a DOC facility is located, um, it's not going to make um, a whole lot of sense um, for CSAPs in those areas to apply, again, since these funds are so specifically focused on service and response 
to um, incarcerated survivors in DOC facilities. Stephanie, we've had another question about how the solicitation will be made available. Will all CSAPs uh, receive the application and then just need to meet the eligibility requirements, or will it go out to a select pool of CSAPs who have uh, facilities within their area? Um, we're still working um, that detail out with our contract folks here in the department, Andrea, but um, but we are thinking that they'll, since geography will be one sort of basic criteria around those CSAPs, um, you know, who would, who would be, um, I, I guess, just sort of geographically positioned to respond, we may be doing a more targeted release at those CSAPs that meet that basic geographic criteria. So I just don't, we don't have that, those details completely worked out yet. Great, thanks, Stephanie. So we have another question just around um, if one was to receive basically how much pre-work needs to be done before applying for the grant in terms of your organization and your advocate readiness. I think that there's um, certainly an appreciation of the volume of work and readiness that does need to happen um, in order to do this work. As a coalition, we are committed um, to supporting you in getting access to training and information to support you in doing this work within your DOC facility. Therefore, we have um, a significant training uh, plan outlined um, as we put up on the first couple, uh, I don't remember what slide it was, but one of the first slides, you know, that we have that forensic medical compliance webinar coming up that we've built in information into um, our conference and that we'll be having a core one-day track. We will continue to send relevant resources out to the field as well as spotlight information um, in our newsletters that we strongly encourage folks to be looking at. I think, you know, really it's at the discretion of your organization in terms of um, allocated time right now that you're devoting to additional readiness. I think that, you know, it's certainly an important thing to be investing some time in, but you also have to balance that with your um, current resources. We have uh, funding to support um, attendance for a designated PREA advocate at that uh, annual conference and all-day training. So those will be things that will come out um, a part of our line budget item to support individuals in that in terms of planning for resource time as well. Um, I hope that answers that person's question. If it doesn't, please just type back in to the chat box. Okay, we have another question. So we have another question about release of information. I think Kelly's going to address that to this person. Yeah, um, there was a question about uh, confidentiality and um, just wanted to reiterate that the same confidentiality rules that you have in the community with survivors um, apply in this setting. So if you would need a release um, in the community, you will also need a release when working with survivors in facilities. And you're right that that is complicated to try to figure out how to get a written release since that's um, a vital requirement. But uh, we will work on that, um, but the confidentiality obligations for advocates are the same. Uh, we have two more questions. Who is answering the hotline now? So that's the PREA support specialist at OCBA. Um, her name is Megan Basquet. Mm -hmm. And then the second one is whether there will be a separate reporting requirement for PREA. Yes. Um, that is something, that, Stephanie, I'll have you comment on too, but absolutely we need uh, relevant data collected by our programs around services to incarcerated um, survivors for a number of reasons. Um, one, we need to be able to capture the breadth of work that we're doing um, for the Department of Corrections and um, provide that to them for their grant reporting. Um, additionally, we want to be able to gauge our services to survivors, so having some of that numeric data is really important. It also helps drive a conversation, um, a much larger conversation outside of just services to prisons, but information, um, but to collect that information so we can bolster an argument potentially 
um, for additional funding that are needed to provide services to all incarcerated survivors. So we really see um, this year, this kind of rollout year, having some concerted um, data collection needs um, just so we can have a full scope of the type of services that are being requested from you from um, facilities as well as to document the breadth of work um, that you are doing and the time spent in doing that work. We also do acknowledge that this work is more, more likely than not to be a little more time intensive um, just because of the setting in which it's being provided and some of the additional leg time that you might have um, in terms of follow up with um, the incarcerated survivors. So that's just another reality. Um, Stephanie, if you could speak to, we're getting the question of, in addition to InfoNet, um, might we have other additional reporting requirements? So it is just as Andre has described, so in addition to the basic um, client and service data that programs currently report in InfoNet, um, you know, as we're looking at, you know, what additional information may be needed in regard to reporting to DOC um, around these services and in terms of informing, um, you know, sort of statewide planning for um, and anticipate trying to project you know, future needs around these services. Um, there may be some additional pieces that, that ultimately what we would like to fold into to InfoNet so that, in other words, you're still reporting in one place. Um, it takes some time to, one, determine what additional data reporting might be needed and then to build that into InfoNet. Um, so certainly with an anticipated grant start date by March 1st, there's not going to be additional reporting requirements in terms of um, InfoNet reporting. So um, what I think we foresee at this point is that um, with the new grants effective March 1, um, initially in the first few months of those grants, the focus is really on that, you know, supporting programs with the advocate training pieces that, that Andre talked about, Andre Kelly talked about earlier, and some of the readiness work. Um, so in terms of client service, there won't be a lot of additional reporting at that stage. So um, what I would foresee is that there may be just some basic data reporting components that are built in effective March 1st, and then as we work with our partners at the coalition and at DOC around other reporting needs, we fold those in, um, particularly as we go into the second kind of the second year of these grants or the next fiscal year, state fiscal year 15, starting July 1. Thank you, Stephanie. We're having a few questions from folks who have just kind of some nuts and bolts around the grant process. Um, curious about um, how the pool of money will work um, to provide services um, in terms of the granting, will folks get a set amount or how will that work for them in their communities? So we're looking at um, some kind of um, uh, way of distributing funds that takes into account um, some of the basic costs of doing the readiness work, um, staff training, you know, some of the basic pieces that any program doing the, the PREA services um, will need to do, whether they would be working with a relatively small facility or whether they'd be working with a really large facility. So um, we're looking at something that would, again, could try to take into account kind of those basic costs for any program involved in the work, and then have an additional piece folded in that, that takes into account um, programs that may be located in a county that has two or three DOC facilities. Um, we do have a couple of counties like that um, where um, the number of, there's more than one facility, for example, and um, the facilities in their county or region may be quite large and have um, a very high population. So we're really trying to factor in both, you know, both pieces um, into to how the funding would be distributed. And we'll have information about that in when we release the, the application. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, we had a question about the hotline number, and that will be on the brochures that we email out with the slides. Great. Well, these have been wonderful questions so far. Um, does anyone have any additional questions?
If not, uh, what is there anything in particular that WICSAP can do to further support you in thinking about your PREA implementation work? Andrea? Yeah. Oh. Hi, it's Lori again. Hey, one more question for me about the grant. Is this one that just the CSAP will do, or do we do it in um, conjunction with the facility? Hi, Lori, you? this is Stephanie. Um, at this point, it's, it's an application that just the CSAP will do. Okay, great. I was just trying to figure out kind of planning that. So yes. Yep. Um, there's a question about what CSAP should be doing right now. And I would say, um, so we sent out some materials with the call, that JDI advocacy manual, that would be a great place to start um, with your readiness. Um, make sure to attend all the upcoming trainings that we have got scheduled. Uh, go tour your local, arrange to tour your local facility. Um, we will, uh, what I'm, one thing that I'm working on right now is setting up um, a special page of the WICSAP website that's gonna house a bunch of resources and some of that will be on a public page and then some will be um, a login only page that will include recordings of these webinars. So we will house resources there that can help you with your readiness as well. I think another thing you can do, and we mentioned this on our previous call, was take a look at your current hospital practices. Um, what kind of examine your relationships that you currently have with your um, hospital and some of your other systems partners. Um, does your hospital provide um, a private room uh, for the, ex well, of course, there's a private room for the examinations, but how confidential can that room be made for an inmate? Um, does it have the potential to have an additional curtain pulled where a correctional officer could stand behind? Are the curtains available at the hospital that that might be a provision to be put in place? Um, these are some of the considerations that we'll get more into on the medical forensic exam, but it's one of the things to start thinking about when you examine what your current practices already are in terms of medical examinations with uh, rape survivors. Stephanie, we um, have a question about how CSAP should be billing time spent on these webinars. I'm not sure if that's something that someone should contact you directly about or if you have an answer to that that you could give. Uh, that is a great question. I am comfortable with time for this being billed to current contracts. It's general training time to learn about where we're going. It's not direct service provision to incarcerated survivors. So you can send that to your current sexual assault grants. Great questions. We have a couple more minutes. We want to be able to um, field any additional questions folks have, go ahead and continue to type those in the chat box or go ahead and ask over the line. Hi, it's Lori again. You've got a lot of questions here. Um, in the reading, and I know this was through Pennsylvania, but um, it had mentioned about the, a training offered for Department of Corrections staff kind of as a part of this whole process. And I just wondered, is that something that um, that is already done here? Is it something that would be um, ideally done in conjunction with the CSAP? Or what, can you give me any sense of what that looks like for um, the Department of Correction staff that are having to deal with this? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I can tell you what we're doing in the collaboration. I think um, outside of what we're doing in the collaboration, the Department of Corrections is doing um, multiple internal trainings around PREA standards. They've sent out um, a lot of resources to their officers um, and um, staff around other PREA standards and rules of compliance. Uh, we know that they have shared information around what is advocacy. We created some materials for Department of Corrections staff um, specific to understanding what advocacy is, what a community sexual assault program is, what those services look like, uh, what the model of services we are um, rolling out in our state look like and what that means for inmates as well as access to staff who also might have sexual assault trauma. Um, and want to access community resources. You know, we certainly recognize that um, there are many staff who too have sexual assault trauma, um, and this may be a new resource that um, they're hearing of for the first time. And we wanted to make it clear that it just wasn't available for inmates, uh, but that 
um, they could access um, community sexual assault programs, not through the hotline, of course, but just through traditional means to know that that's available for them as well, that it's not an inmate exclusive um, service. We are working with the Department of Correction staff as part of this collaboration, and that's really what we've been doing for the last year and a half to really cross share information and train each other. Um, we definitely uh, foresee some opportunity to do some more concerted work, uh, more formalized training with each other around that. Um, but it has been an ongoing process of cross-sharing and information that we will continue to be doing um, through the process of, of this grant work. There's a question about where the PREA standards can be found. Um, they are on the PREA Resource Center website, and I can email a link um, there. We will also have a link um, to that page on our WixApp PREA page once it's created. And yes, we will be sending the PowerPoint slides um, in addition to the handouts that I've mentioned about um, DOC terms and definitions of sexual misconduct, um, the brochures, so we will be getting a resource packet of information um, with the webinar slides. Wonderful. Well, we want to thank everybody so much for your great questions and um, make ourselves available to you. Please don't hesitate to contact Kelly or myself with any questions that you have. As Kelly shared, we'll continue to, um, we will follow up with you after this webinar by sending you a uh, significant amount of uh, resources, including this PowerPoint presentation. Please don't forget also that it is recorded so you'll have access to this recorded webinar as well. And our plan is to have that um, web page up by the end of the month, and I will email out the information as, um, to the group as soon as it is out. Okay. Um, just another point for a resource, and we can add this link um, to the information packet that we're sharing with you, but DOC also has an external website that has quite a bit of information around um, PREA compliance available for general community. It's more um, what is offered to the families and people in the community, but it would give you an idea of what we've got going on in some of our brochures and that type of thing. So it is the external one that would be good for them. I will send a link to that as well. Um, there's a question about when this information is going out. Um, I will hopefully get it out to you this afternoon, and if not, then um, tomorrow morning. Great, so thank you everybody for taking your time out this morning to have this really important conversation with us. Um, we are committed to um, continuing to bring you the most up-to-date um, and current information as things in our PREA um, statewide collaboration continue to develop. We will keep you in the know. Um, please do um, stay cued in to the various resources that we're sending out and don't hesitate to ask. Um, us any questions along the way. We really appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please stand by.